<laughs> and now live. OK, thank you very much and welcome all. Good afternoon. I'm Councillor Rob Humby, Leader and Executive Member for Hampshire 2050 and Corporate Services and welcome to my decision day, which is currently being broadcast live on YouTube via the County Council website. I'd also like to welcome Councillor Ross Chad, here, Deputy Leader and Executive Member for Hampshire 2050 and Corporate Services. Councillor Kirsty North, Executive Member for Performance, HR, Comms and Inclusion and Diversity. Councillor Jonathan Glenn, Select Committee Chairman. I haven't seen, is Adrian here? Adrian, come, yes, yes, so I've just seen you, Adrian, sorry. Councillor Adrian Collett, Opposition Spokesperson. And Councillor Louise Parker Jones, Opposition Spokesperson. Welcome, and it's good to see you all present here this afternoon. Um, I understand there are no deputations and other being received uh, for today. Thanks for uh, confirming that, Louise. So we've got the uh, key decision and we'll go straight into agenda item one, which is the A326 North Waterside Improvement Update. And I think, Gary, are you going to introduce initially? Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Leader. Good morning, um, members and colleagues. Um, so I'll hand over to Frank um, in a second, uh, Leader. Um, but just to introduce um, this scheme as we give a, um, an update um, following the, the consultation that took place um, last summer on what is a hugely significant um, scheme for residents and communities, both in the New Forest and Waterside area of the county, but also um, much uh, more broadly. Um, Lady, you'll, you'll see from the paper the size and scale of the scheme in terms of the, um, the ambition around the investment. Um, and recognise um, following our Waterside um, steering group that we both attended earlier this week, yeah. the importance of this scheme as a key component part in terms of unlocking that Waterside vision um, and unlocking um, the economic um, potential of um, that <coughs> part of our county. The other final point of reflection from me, and, and it's detailed within the paper, is thinking about this much more broadly than just a road scheme and a road scheme update. Um, the detail within the report also points towards um, maximising and unlocking the economic potential associated with the Freeport and then wider transport um, applications as well in terms of freeing up general movement in that part of the county for all residents and communities with particular reference um, to environmental net gain um, and active travel through cycling, walking and horse riding as well. So that's the general introduction, leader and deputy leader. I'll ask Frank uh, to take you through a bit more detail of the paper and then point you towards the recommendations. That's great. Thanks, Gary. So over to you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Chair. My name is uh, Frank Baxter. I'm the head of integrated transport at Hampshire County Council and the client manager for this scheme. I think the first thing to note is this is a, a big scheme and it's strategically important as Gary has has highlighted. It's strategically important for two reasons which are incredibly important for local residents. One is that this is about addressing traffic flows and congestion on the A326 as it is now, but also helping residents and communities on the waterside cross the A326 which currently presents severance issues to, to the community. It's also strategic because it's look because it's looking forward at the future development that could happen on the waterside, um, a level of development identified in the waterside transport strategy, which is of national importance. It's also on one of the major road network routes in Hampshire, making it um, a scheme on one of the most on the most important <coughs> road classification in Hampshire. It's also uh, being a big scheme it has a, a, a big cost at 125 million and with that comes a number of risks as well. So it has a number of financial risks in terms of moving forward and it also has risks in terms of making sure that what we design is also compatible with very sensitive environmental habitats that the road is going through. So that's been a big part of this scheme. Um, the report has seven recommendations. Um, the first recommendation is reporting on the engagement process that has been undertaken um, uh, at the end of last year. The second recommendation is to ensure that members are fully uh, aware and accepting of the financial risks that we're taking, not only in developing the scheme, but should we be successful in, in getting a, 
uh, positive business case submission to DFT then in taking on the scheme and to deliver it going forwards. Um, it also sets out the principles Hampshire will uh, apply in terms of moving the scheme forward. In this case, a zero appetite risk for taking on cost escalation post business case approval. Finally, the recommendations uh, towards the end of the, the recommendations are looking at administrative processes and asking to delegate authority to the director in order to undertake those actions. I'll just give a quick phrase of the engagement that we've undertaken. Um, just to be clear, there were 35,000 postcards issued to, to the residents of the waterside and business places. There were five face-to-face -face events down the waterside where we asked and met with residents and businesses to identify what their issues were. And we produced various documents that went onto the website, including a fly-through video image of the whole of the road improvement to make sure that the public could really get under the roots of the scheme and understand what it was about. Um, the results of the engagement came back uh, with mixed views, uh, with an almost equal proportion the number, a number of people who are concerned about the environment were out were just slightly outweighed by those who who were actually concerned that it didn't go far enough in terms of widening and enhancing um, uh, traffic volumes. Um, it's worth noting that we didn't at the time present any journey time data and we didn't present the details of the habitat mitigation. So some of the feedback was noticeably coming back questioning what was next in terms of those two items. So that didn't that didn't that that's one of the issues that we picked up at the next stage when we get into consultation. Um, dealing with severance became a very strong point. Lots of people were really important, found that actually crossing the A326, particularly for local communities who responded in force to the consultation, were very keen on making sure it would be easier to cross the road if we're widening it at the same time. Um, there were very high levels of support for some of the junction changes, in particular to Twigs Lane, where we know that there are all already uncomfortable junctions to use. So there are some junctions up and down the A326 that got a lot of support for that reason. Um, those are probably the main highlights. I won't go any further, so I'll just commend the report to, to you, Councillor Humby, and to the rest of the committee. Frank, uh, thank you very much for that, and to Gary. And I know Gary, you'll come back and maybe make a few comments at the end. Yeah, I'm going to go straight to members. So, uh, Adrian, you've got your hand up. Councillor Collett first. Um, thank you, Rob. I uh, have been a little bit um, <clears throat> shocked, I suppose, disappointed at uh, the view of local members not being at all supportive of this. And then I look at slide 16 and I can see that they're in line with public opinion, which uh, on slide 16, it shows the number of people who disagree that the preferred scheme will deliver against the design priorities compared with those who agree with a 20% margin um, in favor of disagreeing rather than agreeing. In fact, the number who strongly disagree pretty much equals all of those who, who agree. So I've looked a little bit further at why there is such hostility to the scheme. Um, and one of the comments that was made to me is that all it does is it moves the pinch points to different locations. It doesn't actually uh, eliminate them all. Uh, another is that it does little for South Waterside, uh, which is also very busy, uh, but isn't helped at all by this. Just people from South Waterside will, will get into a traffic jam in a different location. Um, and the big fear that what this will actually in the end facilitate is the development of Dibden Bay by ABP. Um, so there's a lot of suspicion, a lot of um, hostility. Um, it's also disappointing that we don't seem to be making a lot of um, progress with the rail option down the water side, which is something I would like to have seen and something I've hoped we would see for a very long time. So. Leader, I need to make you aware of that. I'm sure I've not really said anything that you're not already aware of, uh, but um, <coughs> those are the views that I've had from members, not just of my own party. Yeah, Aidan, thanks for that. And I'll let Frank or uh, um, well, maybe yourself come back. But I will just say there has been a huge amount of engagement. And I think initially, I think a lot of what you were saying was maybe correct. But I think there's been a lot of clarification about what the additional benefits are to that. 
And as Gary said at the beginning, it's not just the road speed. So I think we might have moved on maybe a little bit from that, but I'll let Frank come back because you've seen the huge amount of engagement. I understand what you're saying about the reports and the charts and that as well. But I think, as I say, uh, we attended the Waterside meeting with all the partners there, and I think there was a much better understanding of the value of this over and above just being a road scheme. But maybe, uh, Frank, you'd like to comment on some of the points that uh, Councillor Collins made. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rob. Um, I think the main point is that the modelling that we've done shows that uh, there is a journey time saving in total and there is also a journey time reliability improvement from the kinds of measures that we've got uh, that we advertised. That didn't come across as strongly in the consultation materials that we put across, so that's one of the weaknesses that we've revealed in the consultation so far, which will pick up in the um, when we get to the consultation state, that issue will be picked up with more definitive data on the modelling. As to the southern waterside junctions, those junctions can be awkward to use, but the main pinch points are to the north. So anybody coming from the south going through the north will benefit from the same benefits as anybody living at the northern end as well. So those two issues um, probably are resolved through the modelling that, that we're aware of, but we haven't fully shared. Um, the other thing, I think there is a fear um, I think that does lead to a certain scepticism as to the motives behind the road scheme, but in this case the motives are simply to make it better for existing <coughs> residents and to deal with growth on the water side. As to the rail option, a business case has been submitted. It is with the Department for Transport and they are making a determination where they, what they determine, I do not know at this stage. Okay, uh, Adrian, would you like to come back on any of that? I don't think there's anything I would add to what I've said before okay. in the yeah. local concerns. Yeah, OK, and, and that is noted. And as you can imagine, I've, I've had lots of briefings on this. And as I repeat about the Waterside group, where we have many different stakeholders and partners um, within that group as well, including uh, New Forest District Council and New Forest National Park, who we spent a lot of time with and with the chair there as well and um, with Alison Barnes as well talking about that connectivity across there. And I can say I think they've worked really hard with us and vice versa, sort of understanding what those issues, and many of them have, have been addressed now. That's why I, I think we might have moved on a little bit from those first sort of reports where you heard. And we knew after those, uh, sort of that consultation or that engagement that we've had, and I think a lot of that is, is better understood now like the comments that Gary made at the beginning, that it's not just the road scheme. And I think that's how it was presented maybe initially. So I'm very well aware of the points that you've made. And I feel certainly after our meeting last week down in the New Forest, that a lot of those have been, those concerns were raised and, and addressed. Um, Gary, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Into, I will go to other members if necessary, but reference the Waterside meeting that we had. Thank, thank you, Leader. And just a few sort of final observations uh, from myself. Um, I think, as I said at the Waterside Group meeting earlier this week, this is not a decision to build a road. Yeah. This yeah. is a decision to reflect on the consultation and get the scheme development to the next stage, which um, members will note, and you'll note, uh, Leader, is um, scheduled for autumn later this year. So this is a a gateway checkpoint to reflect on the consultation and conclude the work between now and autumn of this year to get to a point of final uh, submission to the Department for Transport. The thing then that um, colleagues will see within the paper that is imperative that happens, and this touches to Councillor Collett's point, is around the local support and buy-in of stakeholders um, during that period and recognising that although Hampshire County Council will continue as scheme promoter, it is absolutely imperative that this becomes a collectively owned project in relation to those lake, local stakeholders taking ownership and supporting the buying of that. And that extends down to parish councils, the district council, the national park, the Freeport, and all of the, those stakeholders getting behind this as a good thing to do for the local area for a huge variety of outcomes um, that Frank has touched on, not just in relation to travel time, but the wider public outcomes that this unlocks. So um, that's everything from me, Rob, just in terms of summation yeah. and wrapping up. Yeah, Gary, thank you very much. That's very useful. Does any other member, Councillor Chair, 
Switzerland, Louise, yeah, Councillor Parker, yeah, hi Louise. Hello, um, thank you. Um, my only uh, concerns are surrounding um, pedestrians and their requirements and I just want to be reassured really that that will be hugely looked at and um, we're always talking about journey times for cars and we mustn't forget our most vulnerable road users when we're we're discussing them so for example our cyclists or horse riders or anybody else who needs to use the the network so just to be reassured really that that is going to be um, key that those points for pedestrians to cross are factored in at their desired lines and it's not done as an afterthought, which means we end up with, you know, crossing points which are not compatible for local residents and uh, are almost ignored. So, thank you. So it's just very helpful, thanks. I'll let Frank come back on that because this was uh, discussed at that meeting. Frank, would you like to comment on the points Louise have made? Yeah, it's, it's been a key design principle of developing this scheme um, so far, and it's one of the objectives that uh, is core to the scheme. So most of the junk, in fact, all of the junctions that we are improving will, will change arrangements where you have no facilities to cross in terms of priority to ones which are activated by signals and give pedestrians the time they need to cross and the safety they need to do it in. I hope that reassures you on those points. As I say, that's why I wanted Frank to do it because that has been looked at. Um, and as, as Frank said, it's been a key point all the way through this as well. Um, any other member would like to make any comment? If not, I'll just um, make well, uh, a uh, Sorry, Adrian, beg your pardon. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I know I've already had a bite at the. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, one of the points I made was the concern about this facilitating future development at Dibden Bay. I, I'm yeah. sure it's not done with the intention of doing that, uh, although some who support it might hope for that. Um, what is our view about unwittingly um, supporting development at Dibden Bay by this? Uh, yeah, it has been raised. And I think Gary, again, this came up at didn't at the Waterside uh, uh, meeting, but that's why I think it became initially sort of a road scheme. But obviously there are so many other benefits from this. And one of the conversations we have with the National Park is the effects and some of that relief that it gives to a lot of those side roads as well. So I understand that, but I think there's so much more to this. Gary, would you like to comment on that again? Yeah, I, and I think it's as with any um, development scheme and economic development scheme um, there's going to be um, sort of sympathetic economic development Adrian as I describe it in the sense that um, local job creation local house house building might not necessarily um, be seen as a negative thing in terms of the facilitation of, 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 of local jobs um, working with the um, local colleges to join um, the um, skills and training provision for um, a a, a corner of the county that doesn't have huge amounts of kind of accessibility. There's kind of one road in, one, one road out through um, the A3, A326 at the moment. I think the important thing is that, as we've, we've touched on this call, it is done in a careful and planned way. So the right infrastructure goes in, the right environmental considerations are considered as part of that, given the proximity to both the national park, but other um, environmental considerations as well. So. I don't think that it's necessarily a binary choice in terms of um, business growth and housing growth in that area is necessarily a bad thing. It just needs to be done in the right way with the right infrastructure put in place. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'll just uh, a quick word of all saying time for that. Adrian, I think the other thing is, as I say, the amount of work that's been done with the other partners and position, uh, specifically the National Park, as I said earlier. So I think they've looked at a lot of these issues as well and also looking for the gains that it would be for them. And they, they're now approaching it in that way. They've raised a lot of concerns in terms of that connectivity as well, but they do see, I don't want to speak on behalf of Alice and Barnes, but I think it's fair to say they understand those issues and they understand the possible gains uh, from the scheme as well. So I, I hear what you're saying, but hopefully that, you know, I'm not being sort of blind to it, if you like, but understand it is much more, I go right back, to more than just the road scheme. But I would like to also just reiterate what Gary said, and I was going to say that about, yes, in terms of our role in the scheme, but this is just to sort of go to the next stage and understand that of the consultation and the briefing and the process that we've been through. 
but needs to make sure that all our partners and um, you know are, are, are fully signed up to this and support this and i think that's key in terms of that that we need to make that very clear as we've had with other issues when we also look at the costings as well and the issues that go with that I, I'm, I'm certainly not going to be in a position when we look at those and, and the outline business case that I'm putting Hampshire taxpayers at risk. And I made that those two points very clear at the Waterside meeting. So hopefully that goes some way uh, to reassuring you, uh, Adrian, uh, on, on the points that, that, that you've raised. Um, are there any further comments from anybody else? Um, Frank, Gary, want to add anything or are you going to? OK, I like that. So. Um, as I say, just to be clear, this is this to take us forward to the next stage in the process. So there's clearly a lot of work to do as well. And the points that Frank outlined about the business case, which of course is happening with all our schemes in terms of that, in terms of the viability as well. But the key point here is about support. You know, it's not our scheme, it's everybody's scheme. I think that's what you know we need to be very clear about. So I'm, I'm very happy um, to accept the recommendations as set out. I can't see anybody else wanting to speak. So uh, I will now, uh, I'm just trying to find my mouse again, which I've lost again. Yeah, to accept the recommendations as set out in powers two to seven on pages uh, five and six. Lou, that be recorded, thank you very much. Okay, right, we will now move on to agenda item two, the non-key decisions. This is the revenue budget and capital program. Uh, for Hampshire 2015. I think Gary, you're presenting this report uh, initially. Is that correct? That's that's correct, leader. And I'll keep Thank it you. relatively um, short and sweet because the paper itself um, and associated appendices contain um, a certain amount of detail already. Um, and colleagues will be aware we attended um, select committee this morning, both for this paper and the next one as well. So there's three core um, things that um, we're proposing for recommendation as part of today's decision day. Um, the first is the revised revenue budget for 23-24, um, which you'll see set out in Appendix 1, um, that updates um, the revenue budget for this financial year from the one that was approved um, this time last year, based on known um, budgetary changes um, throughout the year. And the detail um, for those variants is detailed in the paper. Um, associated with the um, changes in terms of the strategic land team and local nature recovery strategy work um, that we have been requested to do um, on behalf of government. The second um, key recommendation um, for today's decision day relates to approving the revenue budget for 24-25 um, as set out in Appendix 2 um, and the um, Appendix 2 demonstrates um, the similarity between the budget in 24-25 and the original budget for 23-24. So hopefully leader provides you with that reassurance that there are no significant outliers in that regard. Um, and broadly, we are looking at a similar budget for 24-25 um, as we did in a financial year 23-24. And then the final recommendation relates to the approval of a capital budget for both 23-24 and 24-25. Um, as the paper demonstrates, as we've been through the organisational restructure um, over the last um, 12 months, um, this time last year, um, those capital budgets remained where they were in previous um, service um, directorates. We've now completed um, that work organisationally to get those capital budgets in the right places of accountability um, within the organisation. And therefore, Appendix 3 now sets out moving forward um, in financial year 24-25, um, what sits under the authority mm -hmm. of the capital programme and capital budget um, for the 2050 directorate. Uh, so nothing further from me, Leader, and, and recognising mm -hmm. that obviously there's a significant amount of detail both in the paper and the appendices as well. Yeah, Gary, there is, and thank you uh, very much for that. And we should, I'm sure Councillor Glenn might like to make a comment at this point because we did give this a very, or he did, a very thorough airing and lengthy debate at the Select Committee today. And I think it's worth saying that at this point because we are live on the YouTube channel to, to understand that many processes go through to get to this point and there is a great deal of information and detail behind that. Councillor Glenn, would you like to comment on your uh, committee this morning? Thank you, Rob. Um, can I thank uh, both you and the debt leader for being there? So you would have heard all the soft information 
uh, which was discussed over a period of two and a half hours over the two items. Um, yeah. the, 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 <coughs> they were all agreed. The recommendations were agreed, um, not with any provisors, but we, but we need to make sure that the debate about um, uh, strategic land budget is included in your thinking. Uh, a point was well made that um, with one, I'm not going to mention which area it is, but it's one near Basingstoke, that if um, when it was agreed that we would look at it 27 years ago, had we been able to actually start building on it at uh, 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 earlier on, we would now be receiving uh, our um, uh, 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 income from it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now, we can't help time going by, but I think it, there was a lot of debate about the strategic land budget, which I, I'd like you very much, please, Leader, to keep in mind when it goes to Cabinet and when it comes to full council. I might remind you that there was a lot of debate about skills and apprentices. Um, the, there's, there was um, concern about the LEP responsibilities coming to us on the 1st of April. Um, the cost of that and how much would we take on or be able to take on. Uh, there was a lot of uh, debate about the section 114, which always hangs up above us like a like a uh, Damoclesian sword. Um, and we are doing our level best to make sure that never happens. Um, um, and of course, we are all aware that an, a, the huge um, the, the huge pressure on us is coming from the social care costs. I hope that the consultation that they were doing, a lot of people may well from the public have an opinion about that. Uh, Cash, again, Jonathan, thank you very much for that. And again, thank you to you and your committee for, as you say, giving a thorough two and a half hour debate on this. And uh, Ross, myself, Deputy Leader, noted very much all those points that were raised at that meeting, including a discussion around IT and things that we are aware of that as well. Um, and we'll pick up something um, in the next paper in terms of performance and that, and I'll come on yeah. that as well. I first of all just want to check in with other members. I know Councillor Collett, Councillor Louise Parker Jones were present at those scrutiny this morning. Would anybody like to add anything to? Chairman, I think um, Councillor Glenn. Over, yeah. Sorry, I, yes, I think Councillor Glenn has covered the points that were made. Yeah. I don't yeah. think I have to add anything. Okay, thank you for that, Louise. Um, nothing further from me. I'm sure it will be okay. fully debated at full council. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, and, and I come to you both because I know you're both at the select committee and you both heard that as well. And I think it's worth acknowledging that that you, that you were both there as well. Take us through that. I think um, in, in terms of Jonathan, the points you raised, I say that was noted by us and noticed by uh, the officer team, CMT as well, and those things that were, will be picked up. And it's always awkward at this stage when we know the amount of detail in a report and in all the appendices as well that goes with that. Clearly, we won't go through that now because we did do it at select committee and previous briefings before that. So Gary, I want to thank you and your team and obviously the finance team and everybody for, for putting those uh, papers uh, together. I have really nothing to add to that in terms of there were some understandings as well about the letter sequence and everything else. And, and we are working that through at the moment. And what that will mean for us, uh, just Jonathan picking up that on the skills and training side as well, which is very much sits for something that Ros, uh, the deputy leader, is focusing on as well. So some of that, when we've got more detail on that, we will pick up about what our roles and responsibilities are and how we can continue the let work. And it was pointed out, maybe not in the same way, maybe in a way that, that sort of suits us from, from Hampshire point of view, and how we respond to that right across the whole uh, of Hampshire's area, the geography right across the whole. Um, Gary, is there anything you'd like to finish this to add on that? Or you can take No, nothing further from me, Leader. Okay. All right, if there aren't any further questions, I will go straight to the uh, recommendations. As I say, it's just to reiterate the amount of work and detail and discussions that goes into getting a paper to this point, but um, uh, we've, we've been through that now. So I'm happy to accept the recommendations. Uh, paragraphs two to four on page 59. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jonathan, again, for the work you've done with your committee uh, this morning. I'll pass it on. Okay. We will now move on to agenda item three, 
which is the revenue budget for corporate services. I'm not sure we take us through that. Well, Rob, that hi, hi, Rob. Rob, yeah, yeah, thanks, Rob. Yeah, so just obviously this covers both mine and uh, Jack Broughton, they're a, a people and organisation, very similar to, to Gary really. So this is a, a straightforward update of the uh, revenue budget 23-24 and the forward position 24-25. Um, as you heard this morning, probably the key element uh, within this is the need to, to find £1.5 million pounds worth of additional income, most of which will be covered by um, the arrangements we have in place with our partners for annual uplift. So we're, we're fairly comfortable with that. But uh, as you say, a great, great deal of work goes into the to the detail. Um, yeah. But happy to take any questions and I'm sure Jack will be on her areas. Yeah, OK, I'll just check at this point. Jack, is there anything you'd like to add at this point or happy to go to members first? Jack? No, nothing to add. Thank you. Right, OK. OK, any members like to comment? I'll just reiterate again, this was fully discussed at uh, Select Committee as well. So I'll go to Jonathan first. Jonathan. I, I, I've said everything I said basically covered both the items, OK? Uh, I, just want, I just want to thank our three officers for handling the, the debate and the questions so well this morning. Uh, I, there was there were some issues there which, frankly, they, they couldn't answer quite understandably, but the ones they could answer, they were very good at, uh, let's say, getting to the point. Um, and I'm sure the majority of the, uh, well, all the councillors there probably agree, agree with me on that. So thank you very much, Jack, um, Rob and uh, Gary. OK, yeah, thanks again, Jonathan, for that. Um, any other member, Council Pollock, Council Louise? Nothing more from me. Sorry, right, OK, well, the same applies to that, and as you quite rightly said, Jonathan, the only thing I would like to pick up on, there was quite a lengthy debate um, in terms of uh, performance and stuff, quite rightly, that is the place to do that, to be scrutinised as well. And then lots of discussions around how we now work post-COVID when we come in and everything that as well. And I'd just like to point out, because lots of people have views on that, and they were aired at the Select Committee quite correctly. I'd also like to point out that sometimes there is a perception around that about working in, actually in the offices and at home as well. And just also, uh, so sort of to, for Jack and Rob to take back, I speak to uh, leaders of other upper tier authorities on a regular basis, and they're, what, what they're going through, and their teams, and the pressure on staff as well. And just to say, I know, we have some exceptional staff at Hampshire County Council, proud to be leader of Hampshire County Council, because I know the care and compassion that they do within the work that they do. So quite right to be, I think, uh, Jack, you would agree, it's quite right to be asked those questions about performance and that as well. That's, that's the place to do it, that's perfectly appropriate. And I sort of half wish I'd said something at the meeting, but I just want to put this on record now. You know, I think everybody, even the people asking those questions, absolutely understand that, as I say, I'm going to repeat, we have an exceptional workforce and staff that I see from my own eyes, the care and dedication that, that and commitment that they give to the authority, but more importantly, to the residents of Hampshire, whether that be young or old. So hopefully, Jack and Rob, you take that back to the team as well. I see Jonathan nodding as well, and I'm sure he'd want that uh, sort of, uh, you know, in terms of your select committee as well, Jonathan. So, yeah, very much uh, appreciate that. So, so Jack, um, no, no questions for you, just something to, uh, to take back to, to your team as well. But very much again, as Rob said, huge amount of work that detail goes into these reports. And to get to this point, that has all been done. So just to sort of acknowledge that as well. I'm just checking no further questions from any uh, members or anybody else like to comment, no? Okay, so I will take us straight to, to the recommendations then um, on uh, Paris two and three, on page 75. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob and Jack as well. OK, we will now move on to agenda item four, which is the awards and community grant scheme. And I think Emma, see Emma, going to present the report. Emma, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, leader, members, colleagues. We have five grant applications this morning, uh, this afternoon, sorry, across three schemes. So the first two applications on page 98 of your report are made under the Leaders Community Fund. 
The first is from the CPRE Hampshire to um, for the um, construction of a Hampshire hedge, basically a hedgerow corridor linking the South Downs National Park and the New Forest National Park. I think, Lida, you're familiar with this um, project. The total project is £75,000 and officers are recommending a sum of £25,000 to support those elements of the scheme, which um, particularly around the community outreach, outreach and working with schools. The second application under the Leaders Community Fund is for Trinity Winchester, um, a homelessness centre, and this is to support them with energy efficiency measures. So it's a £38,000 project. Our recommendation is that Hampshire County Council provide uh, supports them to the extent of £5,000, which match, is match funding to the Winchester City Council contribution, and the local member, Councillor Hiscock, is supportive. So those are the two under the Leaders Community Fund. Are you happy for me, me to move on? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Parish and Town Council Investment Fund. This is a different grant stream um, specifically for Parish and Town Council and other community groups. And we have one application to this fund from Fair Oak and Horton Heath Parish Council for photovoltaic panels and battery storage. Um, they are seeking just over £13,000 towards a, just over £19,000 project. The local member, Council Broomfield, is aware of the application. And then finally, we have two applications for the Rural Community Fund. The first is an application for Silchester Village Hall to make some improvement to their facilities. Officers recommend £5,000 towards the £66,000 project, and that's to match the applicant's own contribution to the project and recognise that Hampshire County Council has previously supported this group with um, grants in the past. Councillor Vaughan, the local member, is supportive. And finally, an application to the Rural Communities Fund from the Gatton Trust, and this is for solar voltaic panels for their pavilion, and officers are recommending seven and a half thousand pounds towards an eight thousand pounds project uh, sorry seven and a half thousand pounds which is matching uh, winchester district uh, winchester district council's contribution councillor porter the local member is supportive of that right thank you. right thank you very much yeah um are there any questions from members uh hi louis yeah i just and wanted to say I just wanted to say, um, actually, all these are wonderful projects. I think they they will go such a huge way and such small amounts can make such a huge difference locally. Um, obviously, I'm also a Fair Oak councillor um, and I am completely supportive of the Fair Oak and Horton Heath um, um, provision of the solar panels. So I just wanted to say these are brilliant and um, thank you, Lida, for supporting them. Very good. Thank you, Louise, for that. Uh, and for the, I can't see your names in front of that. I assume that's the, the, the cat, is it not the dog? I can't see. <laughs> yes, it is a cat. I couldn't quite see. Just, I don't want to get my cat and dog modeled up. Yeah, thank you. Um, Adrian. <laughs> yes, um, just wanted to ask a question on the Trinity Winchester application. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're seeking 15,100, and I was a little bit surprised that our um, recommendation is a rather parsimonious 5,000 on such a valuable project for vulnerable people. I haven't spoken to Councillor Hiscock, I see that he supports uh, the project, uh, but I wondered are we only giving or recommending 5,000 purely because that's the amount Winchester City Council have given? If Winchester had given 10, would we be recommending 10? But what, what's the thinking behind a rather small recommendation? Thank All right, thank you for that. I'll go to Emma. Thank you, Councillor Collett. We do assess the application in its entirety, and as you'll be aware, our maximum limit is 50% match funding. Um, we do listen very carefully to what the district councils um, district councils recommend because we recognise that where they are locally focused projects, our district council colleagues are um, have have a, a useful insight into those communities. So we do tend to follow what our district colleagues um, recommend in these cases. OK. Hey, you want to, you go OK. Um, any further questions from any members? No, I can't see any hands. What I would say is a bit similar to the other papers, actually, to get to this stage, go through a very lengthy progress. And the deputy leader, Councillor Chad and I, clearly goes through these very clearly. 
And I looked at that one as well, Adrian, but I'm very clear. I think why it's, why this works, this process, is because we have a very clear set of criteria. So knowing what the officers are doing and recommending, we, we, we work to that criteria. And of course, we regularly update it. In fact, we've just been through that, Emma, haven't we, through that, that process of updating. So I think, um, and, and obviously there, sometimes there is history about other support that some of these organisations have had as well. But clearly we listen to our districts and boroughs, Adrian. I think that's the fair thing to say, and it matches up with that criteria. And it does help when people, when they're actually applying, that it's very clear what that criteria is. So I, th I think that helps the process for the, for the applicants, as well as making it easier for ourselves to go through that process. So I'm, I'm, I'm content with that, Adrian, um, with that process, but I think it's a fair question to ask, and hopefully Emma has, has answered that. So um, any further questions? Well, no, okay. Uh, I can't see any other hands up or anybody else wanting to comment. So Emma, thank you to you and the whole team as well that go through that process and do that. I'm very pleased to accept the recommendations as set out on, I'll get my things right in a minute, okay, on uh, paragraph two, A to C on page 93. Emma, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Guidance on agenda item five, guidance on planning obligations, uh, got infrastructure. I think is that. No, no Robert, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce then hand over to Emily if that's okay, leader. So, um, what you've got before you, um, colleagues, is yeah, uh, Barry, can you just move forward a little bit? You're hardly hearing you. Sorry, sorry, is that any better? Oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> Um, so apologies, leader, didn't mean to shout at you. Um, we've got here, colleagues, is um, a guidance on planning obligations and developer infrastructure um, contributions. Um, it reflects um, an exercise and we conducted um, last calendar year um, in terms of a refresh of our planning obligations and developer infrastructure contributions and associated guidance. And as you'll see in the paper, the um, associated um, consultation and associated feedback being built into it. Um, Emily has been leading this work on behalf of our spatial planning teams. And um, so I'll let Emily go through the detail of the paper and cover the recommendations. OK, that's great. Thank you. Hi, Emily. Over to you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Gary. Um, good afternoon, leader um, and members and colleagues. So as Gary mentioned, we've been working on some guidance um, for use by planning authorities and other interested parties in relation to the planning obligations and developer contributions that as an organisation we seek to get from development. So it's um, a lot of corporate activity around collecting contributions has been going on for many years and it was decided in 2020 through a cabinet decision to actually publish or seek to publish a, a sort of comprehensive set of guidance um, and to keep that up to date. So um, as Gary mentioned, we did a consultation um, early in 2023 and I joined the authority in April and have been since working with different services within um, the County Council to just re refine the draft guidance in light of those consultation comments. So the paper today seeks that, that the final guidance is published um, and that the delegated um, authority is given to enable us to keep that guidance as up to date as possible. Um, to enable us to have a web resource for, for users. So the, the landscape around policy and, and planning policy around and infrastructure and developer contributions can be quite fast moving with changes in legislation and planning policy. So it's important that we keep that up to date. Um, so as I say, the paper has an attached appendix which summarises the consultation responses that we received. Uh, I think the overall support from um, the majority of the, the planning authorities within Hampshire that responded was that it is a useful document, um, but they gave us quite a lot of really useful in, um, insight and feedback about how to make the guidance more usable, specifically um, making it clear what the statutory functions are for Hampshire County Council to enable their planning officers to sort of give weight to negotiations and seeking obligations, um, and also to make sure that where we've asked for obligations or contributions, that it's clear what, what strategic objectives we're trying to achieve um, and what sort of published strategies they link, link into. Um, as I say, the report itself highlights and the guidance goes into more detail about how the guidance can be used. So it can be used to just be clear um, for those involved in negotiations about Hampshire's sort of practical approaches to securing Section 106 contributions. 
but we also provide eight sections. So it's quite a comprehensive document uh, across all the different areas and flag where there's statutory functions and the level of contributions we'd seek and how they're justified and also some other planning guidance and signposts to to those involved in planning applications to find out more um, about different elements within the county council um, that are involved with with making planning decisions so particularly around travel planning and transport um, so i think that's it so thank you very much that's great emily and thank you very much for uh, presenting that um, I will go straight to the member, see if any member has a comment on this paper. Adrian. Um, thank you, Chair. The, when, in the good old days, when I was chair of the Roads and Development Committee and we were putting together a structure plan many years ago now, um, one of the things we spent a lot of time and energy on was looking at developer contributions um, and making sure that the county council and indeed our district councils got the contributions that, that, that they should. Um, and the result of that work, and um, we employed consultants and did quite a lot of background work on it, was, was very clear. Uh, and that was that most of the elements in any development, the cost is fixed, whether it's labour to carry out the work or the materials, that those costs are pretty much fixed. And the value of the development at the end of the day, that's pretty much fixed by the market. The flexible element, if we want to ensure that there is room for the development to make the contributions they should be making is the price paid for the land. If they know they've got to pay an extra half million in developer contributions, then they factor that into the price they're willing to pay for the land. And Farmer Giles, with his 10 acres worth 10,000 an acre, suddenly finding that they're, oh, he's only going to get half a million an acre rather than 600,000, but he can still retire to the Bahamas if he wants to, isn't going to say no. So the, the, the issue is about being very clear up front about what developer contributions are going to be required, preferably before there's any discussion on land values. Now, obviously, this paper and these policies are designed, this guidance is designed to achieve that. So therefore, yeah. I very much support the direction of travel. But I can't overstress um, how important it is that this is there in the forefront all the time. And the other element is that the officers who are actually carrying it out understand the importance of this. I, I've been disappointed on a number of occasions when there have been developments and I don't feel we've secured anywhere near what we should have secured out of the developments. Um, and I wonder sometimes if if officers need more confidence that we really mean this. Um, it really does need to happen and they need to fight for every penny for the purposes for which the contributions are designed. So generally, Chairman, I support this. Um, it's a really important paper. Thank you. Uh, Adrian, it's a really good point, Sam. I think you sort of asked the question there. That's the very reason why the paper's doing that, to give that confidence and also the certainty in terms of developers as well, what's expected. So, Emily, would you like to just comment on that before I go to Councillor Glenn? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's a really important point about being as early as possible up front about what we're seeking to achieve. And um, in the planning team within Hampshire 2050, we're trying to work as close as possible on some of the emerging planning documents. So those that are involved in plan making can, can see. So specifically, the plan may have a viability assessment for it. And it's important that we look at the proposals and, and get into the detail, if you like, and compare kind of what our wish list or our, our obligations requirement is compared to what the viability assumptions have been put into those plan policies. So that's an important route in for us. And also um, the planning authorities have to prepare infrastructure delivery plans. And again, we need to make sure we don't miss a trick there. We're flagging on any infrastructure requirements and then the sector can see up front as early as possible what's required. Yeah, that's great, Emily. And I think Adrian would say that work that's been done at the district councils as well benefits everybody, doesn't it? And it literally my saying of joining up the dots. So I hope you'd agree that's the benefit of doing that. Councillor Glenn. Uh, thank you, Rob. Um, interesting paper, this actually. It's, you know, coming up for a decision. But I agree with Adrian here. I mean, we, we go back a long way on our district council and we both basically first met on the planning. Um, which, fr frankly, in those days, I thought that's all we did. Um, um, the uh, it, it still goes on. Uh, I I haven't read the, the whole paper, so forgive me. But 
Um, it's things such as when residents start moving into new estates, when residents start moving into new estates and start settling in um, before the estate is actually finished, this quite often brings up a whole host of problems uh, such as uh, you know the, the state of the place, the, the roads that haven't been finished, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Does this paper give us more um, teeth to make them get on with sorting out issues? That's really my first question. If it doesn't, we need to give the our local councils teeth to say um, if this is happening, you do something about it now or else. Yes. Uh, John, an interesting question. I know Emily will, will answer that. You're quite right though in terms of the local authority and a lot of that in terms of the agreements in terms of trigger points when the first houses are occupied and then when it's something else completed. Emily, any thoughts on that in terms of this paper? Yeah, just to flag that, um, yeah, it's a very long uh, guidance document, but buried, buried within it, there is some guidance and signposting to um, the County Council's expectations around road maintenance and adoption. Um, so if that's what you were referring to in terms of the state of the site yeah. itself, um, yeah. I know there's yeah. been quite a crackdown on that and um, and new sort of policies around commuted sums put in place. So this document will signpost to that. Um, but you're right to raise it and the government through its Leveling Up and Regeneration Act is trying to bring in a lot more um, stipulations on developers to um, yeah, conform with what they say they will um, in terms of their applications in the first instance and also to get on with applications once they're approved. So there is some movement in the background around that as well. Thank you for that. The second part of this, because you mentioned trigger points, that was my second point, so I won't go over that. The, the third is the, the unexpected issues arising because uh, officers and councillors alike, they're, they're not omniscient, be, being able to actually foresee the problems that are going to crop up. And for example, I, I when you, an estate goes up, you then have access and egress issues for people trying to get out of the estate onto a main road, which weren't actually might not be noticed beforehand. Um, what we want to make sure is that because that's a road or a traffic issue, it belongs to the county and we need to make sure the county is responsive to that sort of complaint. Yeah, I understand, Jonathan. Yeah, again, I'll go through in a sec, but that's where that joined up piece of work with the districts and boroughs. In yeah. terms of any sort of conditions and agreements about that in the construction phases, I think, and this has yeah, come yeah. up before. Emily? Yeah, just to flag as well, um, Councillor Glenn, that the guidance, as well as talking about obligations, it stresses the need for the pre application stage and the pre application offer that the County Council can give to make it very clear to applicants at the early stage as possible um, around transport guidance and transport requirements and the, be the most preferred access and so on, so that. Um, it doesn't come at the 11th hour. So we really do stress pre-app and, and, and signposts to make that as easy as possible for the applicant and start those conversations early. OK, OK, thank you, Rob. I mean, that's great. Thank you very much. Any further questions from any other members? OK, Ross, no, OK. Um, thank you for that. And Emily, thank you very much for answering those questions as well. Um, very good, excellent, thank you. Um, I, have nothing further. I have nothing further in terms of that. Just to say another and literally another paper that's a huge amount of work gone into it. And I'm very pleased to see that sort of joining up the dots. So it helps us and others as well. I mean, not, you know, not just the districts and boroughs, but for the, with the developers in sort of setting out that guidance so people know where they are before they actually look into these. So yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so happy to accept the recommendations as set out in Paris three and four on page 103. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Emily. OK, I'm now going to read out uh, a formal notice to exclude press and public before asking that the webcast be en uh, ended. Sorry. So exclusion of the press and public that the public be excluded from the decision day during the following item of business. And it is likely in view of the nature of the business to be transacted or the nature of the proceedings that if members of the public were present during this item, there would be disclosure to them of exempt information within Paris 3, Part 1 of Schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972. And further, that in all circumstances of the case, the public interest in maintaining the exception outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information for the reasons set out in the report. 
So now can I please ask that the webcast be stopped and Louise, can you confirm when that's happened? Thank you very much. Will do, thank you.